tonight on CrossFeed. The LCMS and NIV 2011. The Freedom from Religion Foundation and Tennessee. Hollywood and the Bible. Pastors posing nude. And the Mrs. Jesus fragment. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church, Dedham, Massachusetts. Good to be with you all again. Yep. It's been a while. Yeah. I st- oh, um, this is, we're recording this on September 30th. Um, I still don't have the one from two weeks ago posted. Been pretty busy, yep. but. I, that, that's what happens when you have young children and you have a church that's, that's, that's doing things. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's what it comes down to. I know. I mean, you could go back to Iowa where nothing was happening, and you know, you had all kinds of free time. We are in a huge transition right now. Uh, we're actually right now. Um, we are establishing our new. Um, I, I just met with my my sta- my new staff this week, um, and need to meet. I met with them collectively. I need to meet with them individually, um, and and literally th- this coming week. We are going to sit down and begin to put together our um, our guiding principles with our new governing board. So I mean, you know, we're it's we're a huge transition right now, and and that's really small um, compared to the other stuff that we're doing. <laughs> um, but you know, at the same time, I, I have to tell you, I had this really cool experience today. Um, at our second service, which is our contemporary or horizon service. Um, I've been putting together the PowerPoints. Uh, my daughter was doing it and, uh, she got busy with schoolwork. And, um, so I took it over again and, um, and, and what you do is just take like the previous weeks. And since they follow kind of the same format from week to week, you just swap out the, um, last week's songs for this week's songs, you know, make any other necessary changes. Well, I figured out um, about three quarters of the way through the service that I forgot to swap out the last two songs. They had the wrong songs on there, and the band wasn't prepared for them. And uh, and it was like, uh, yeah, we didn't bring our music for these songs. <laughs> oh, great! What am I going to do? And so we just skipped one of them. And then the closing song, I was like, oh, I'll just run back there quick and um, and switch switch it real quick and. Um, and I, I felt terrible and, and I, about, you know, not double check in and, may, you know, it was just, I got busy doing something else while I was in the middle of doing it. When I came back, I thought I was done, but I wasn't, and you know, and okay. So I had preached today on James five and, and I'm talking about if anyone's sick, um, or if, if anyone's, uh, uh suffering you should pray if anyone is happy you should rejoice and you know and 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 i really focused on um the parts where he emphasizes uh confession and forgiveness and i talked about the priesthood of all believers on how we can um we have the the blessing of forgiving each other and 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 things like that and and really focused a lot on forgiveness and um and so i'm i'm back there um you know, messing around with PowerPoints and stuff at the end of the service. And I said, I'm really sorry about this. And, and then a voice piped up. I don't even know who it was, but a voice piped up and said, you're forgiven. And it was so cool because I've been talking about forgiveness the whole service. And, and, and so to have somebody say that to me was just, it was, it was like, it went from, I, I, I said, you know what, if I had, um, I, I, I would have beat myself up about this all week long and I would have felt so terrible. But instead, because of that forgiveness, and I saw a bunch of heads nodding about, you know, that I'm forgiven, you know, instead, I'm like, this is so cool. I am, I feel, I feel great. And, and this is just, it's completely transformed my week. I'm so excited about this forgiveness, you know, and, it's just, it's something that it's so easy to take for granted, but man, tell people they're forgiven. Give them that forgiveness that Jesus gives to us. 
it's just so powerful. And I got to experience it today. Usually, you know, as a pastor, I'm on the giving end. And so it was, it was really cool to, in, in a service, to, to receive it. Good. Cool. That sounds awesome. So what kind of pictures do you have on your slides? <laughs> uh, yeah, not a lot of, you know, Michelangelo. Do you have any artistic pictures? <laughs> Not that kind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, actually, this is wrong. Where is it? Pastors posing nude. I, I I screwed that up because this really is pastors taking nude photos. Mm -hmm. uh, the opposite. And so this is from St. Louis, um, and there is a, an Episcopal, Episcopal priest. Name is uh, John Blair, and uh, he he is a professional photographer. And um, he has taken lots of photos with nude models. Um, and he calls them artistic nudes and fine art erotica. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, you know, we need to, you know... The <laughs> so when we were in, 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 in Paris in the Louvre... Um, there's this one picture of some battle. I'm not even sure the battle. And, and all the men we met were nude. You know, and Janice and I are looking at this picture going, right. They're going to have their swords and they're going to have these, these belts strapped on and they're going to be running around with no clothes on. <laughs> and a little boy goes, Dad, why are they naked? <laughs> and the dad goes, oh, they just didn't wear clothes in those days. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't like you are going to get killed doing this. It was a really stupid picture. Um, and so, and to a certain extent, nudity's always been part of our book. Mm -hmm. But maybe this is just another issue. Um, he's 40 years old, and he's not hiding this, by the way. He's been real open about it. Um, but much of his photography is of adult female models in, in classic nude poses. Uh, also, some of it is uh, male and women in uh, 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 sexually exp explicit sexual poses. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All right. So here's whenever these sort of things come up, it always begs the question, and this goes way back to um, the the questions of. Uh, where you had, what was it, People versus Larry Flint or something like that. Um, and, like, what is pornography and what's not? Right. Okay. And, um, and, and the answer, um, I've heard this several times from, uh, Ravi Zacharias. Um, if you don't listen to his podcast, grab it. It's great. Um, he, uh, he, he talks about it and he says, you know, the difference is that, um, pornography, it, it, it comes down to purpose. Pornography is intended to titillate. Right. right. And, and, well, you know, and, well, I mean, you know, wouldn't the purpose of fine art, art erotica be to... Yeah, exactly. And that's I mean, the difference. That's kind of given in, in the name there. Right, right. And so, yeah, that's just a, a classy, fancy-sounding name for porn. But you know what? If you call it a gentleman's club, it doesn't mean there's gentlemen attending there. You would know more than I. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, you hangs around the centers, folks. You know, you they stop Jesus, doing Jesus that, hung man. around the centers. Dale's out there hanging <laughs> around the centers. Oh, anyway. <laughs> he doesn't know what to say in response to that. He's like, no, I don't hang around any sinners. <laughs> well, not those sinners. <laughs> yeah, I hang around with those sinners, but not in that place. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, and so, this is the kind of an issue in the Episcopal Church, you know. Uh, the you know, uh, uh, with the diocese in, there in Missouri. Although he's earlier in trouble 
in 2004 for some sort of impropriety, but they don't say what, what it was or anything. Um, he was also a uh, friar in the Episcopal Order of St. Francis um, and the Order's general minister um, said that uh, – um, uh, Was. <laughs> you know, he called his, his questionable artwork – and uh, release Blair from his vows and from the order. In other words, cost him out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he's a, a, a monk with Celebrating Life Ministries, and they're trying to figure out what this stuff. And again, it calls it erotic photography uh, in the article. Um, I see, I'm folks. trying to figure out why Episcopalians are doing having a problem with this because you know it seems to me you know I, you, you, you're ordaining you know. You, Gays and lesbians. Why is this wrong? Yeah, yeah. Where do you draw the line? You know, I, I mean, mean, why do you draw also, the line? They, they said it's something like exploitation, ex- exploitative. But his models say he was professional and respectful. So they didn't see him being exploited. Yeah, I, they're going to need to kind of define their terms because they're sort of. It, it, it's not like they're walking on a thin line. They're like jumping back and forth across it. Uh, he's being in, uh, uh, investigated for offenses ranging from immorality to conduct and becoming a member of the clergy. Okay, so you divorce your wife and marry your boyfriend and then you can become a bishop? That's not conduct and becoming a member of a clergy? No, no, that's okay. <laughs> but as soon as you take a picture of her, that's it. No. All uh, right. So, so here's the deal. All right. First of all, erotic photography, you can call it what you want. It's porn, and it's inappropriate, okay? Um, I don't know. That's not somebody else says, a uh, sociology professor says, this is the priest who's pursuing art. He'll be okay. And, and that may well be in the Episcopal Church, all right? But as far as God's concerned, I, and I, I do have to say, I have changed my view of what is a godly marriage, all right? I used to say one man, one woman, married for life. All right. But I realize that you can't have a godly marriage without God. <laughs> and, and so now I have to say one man, one woman, married for life, with Christ as the center of the marriage. All right. And I always like left out that last part. Didn't even, you know? I think it was a given. I think it was something you assumed you, you know, because you're talking within a Christian context of a church. You don't think of an atheist man and woman being married. Yeah, I mean, I guess. You, you know, know, that's that was a presupposition that you made. I guess, but at the same time, um, <laughs> I see marriages fall apart over and over, and the biggest problem they have is Christ is not at the center of their marriage. Right. So, you know, that's the key to the rest of it. So, um, but, you know, that means that there is no place for pornography in a marriage because you're bringing somebody else into that marriage. Even if it's only pictures of them, you're still bringing them into the marriage. Right. Um, and Jesus talked about that. If a man looks at, with lust at at a, a woman, he's committed adultery with her. Well, if you're looking at a picture of somebody and it's causing those sort of feelings in you, uh, folks, that's lust, and Jesus says that's adultery, All right? And um, now, as far as the question of nudes, or, or is nude photography and nude art uh, sinful? You know, I, I, I thought about this, and, and this is something that, that I've sort of struggled with over the years, um, as far as, you know, what do we as Christians do with that? Um, because it's not a sin to appreciate the human body it's creation of god and and it's beautiful okay um but at the same time uh we do have a tendency as uh human beings to um be influenced um mentally emotionally um even regardless of the intent of the artist um for a lot of people seeing especially a a photograph as opposed to say you know a statue of david or something like that um that it it, 
uh, conjures up certain thoughts. Okay. Um, and so to some degree, a person has to sort of decide for themselves, um, but decide honestly and pray about it. Um, and, and say, God, where am I at with this? Um, is, you know, does it, if looking at, um, you know, classic artwork that includes nudity, if that produces that sort of feeling in you, um, and, and causes your mind to wander into places it should not go, then, um, which involves, you know, places where you should be with your spouse and not with anyone else, um, then, yeah, you really shouldn't be looking at that stuff. Um, and, and then when it comes down to, I mean, some people can look at it and, and it doesn't affect them that way. And so those people, I would say it's okay. But there's also this question of, you know, what, where St. Paul says, all things are permitted, but not all things are beneficial. And, and there's also the whole idea of, um, making sacrifices where you are free, but sacrificing your freedom for the sake of the weaker brother. In in our sex obsessed culture, um, nude photography, it's pretty hard to um, to produce that sort of thing without a whole lot of people being led into sin by it. It's you're you're running a close line. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. And and so for especially for a member of the clergy who and clergy are held to a higher standard. All right. Um, yeah, not really appropriate. It's just, it's not beneficial. It's permitted, but it's not beneficial. And therefore, because the uh, clergy are, you know, our goal is to lead people to Christ. Um, that is going to lead more people away from him than to him. I agree, I agree, but I think he should be made an Episcopal bishop. <laughs> I see great things for this guy in his career in the Episcopal Church. I really do. Uh, no, because he was a man and a woman. <laughs> yeah, so, all he's, yeah, all, uh, um, um, on the other hand, um, he's out there taking pictures of nudes, but Hollywood's taking, making movies out of the Bible. Go figure. <laughs> uh, go figure. Now, this is interesting, though. This, this is, um, I mean, um, over the years, there have been, you know, different, uh, uh, Bible movies, the Ten Commandments, um, and some others, and it kind of hit the real. They didn't mention VeggieTales Jonah. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, you know, but I mean, I'm talking historically, and I then know. it kind of hit a, um, shipwreck with uh, the greatest story ever told, which was just kind of overdone and everything. Um, so that was one area there. Well, now Hollywood is, uh, you know, I guess I guess maybe figuring out that, you know, the superheroes can only go so far. And so we need to find another really cool book that has no copyright on it and, you know, is in the so public domain. Those royalties, uh, yeah. And it's cheap. So let's go with the Bible. You know, you don't have to pay, you don't have to pay royalties to those writers. This is cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, called tithing. <laughs> so this, uh, in the next year, there's going to be a $125 million movie of Noah starring Russell Crowe and directed by Dar Darren Aronofsky, uh, who is, um, quite a director. I mean, that, that's almost a, a, amazing. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> also coming up is uh, a movie about Moses uh, called God and Kings uh, with Steven Spielberg. Um, Warner Brothers recently acquired a script for Pontius Pilate. I wonder if it's based on uh, Paul Meyer's book. Um, and uh, um, 20th Century Fox is uh, develop uh, working on a movie on the about the Exodus. And Sony's is working on uh, the redemption of Cain, and Lionsgate is Mary, the mother of Dry uh, Christ, uh, a prequel to the Passion of the Christ. You wonder if they're going to do that one in in Hebrew again or Aramaic. Uh, I don't know. It'd be interesting. Yeah. So I mean, all right. So w with Noah, I'm I'm kind of 
Noah was, what, 600 years old when he started building the ark? Um, Russell Crowe's not quite that old, but, uh, so th- I mean, obviously they're taking some liberties. Um, but, uh, I, I suppose we don't know what Loa what, or what Noah looked like. Um, and, uh, how all of that, uh, longevity kind of stuff affected the body. Um, so I guess Hollywood's free to do what they want with that. Um, my big question is this. When the animals start coming onto the ark, are they going to have them um, two of each kind, or are they going to have two of some kinds and 14 of others? It's my little nitpicky thing about the story of Noah. (laughs) Because all the clean animals, it was seven pairs. Yes, we know. (laughs) Um, but no, I, I'm excited about this. I, I think it's great. I mean, I, I don't think that, that Hollywood is all of a sudden, you know, um, confessed Christ or something like that. Um, they're cashing in on Christ. It's a Christ with a little line through the sea. <laughs> That's right. Uh, as, um, Keith Green famously said, there's money to be made in Jesus name and the world is going to make it. Hmm. Yeah, and um, there is. Uh, um, uh, I mean, and you, it could be if it's done right. I mean, you know, and in uh, Aaron Fosky, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name. I mean, he directed Black Swan. Um, he's done some other stuff. I mean, he's a good director. Um, you know, depending on what he does with the story. I mean, he's talking. He says, uh, "Well, it's kind of a s- sketch." And so this team will have to flesh out the narrative with their own interpretation. Yeah. You know, so what what are they throwing out underneath there? Well, but you know. I'm encouraged by the fact that they realize that, um, like evangelical Christians or Bible believing Christians, or I mean, I don't think they really know what that means um, in a lot of Hollywood. All right, but you know, it's people that take these stories seriously. All right, and believe them to be historical. All right. Um, they recognize that these people will spend a lot of money to go see these movies where they're not big movie goers otherwise. And, um, and so they don't want to offend too much. That's, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't, I don't know if you could say they're not big movie goers overall. No, um, I, I mean, they I, I mean that. seriously, I, I can't think of anybody that I've met in any church, you know, that isn't fairly well versed in, you know, pop culture. I mean, I can refer to movies all the time, and at least I don't know some of the people in my church get get yeah, understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, but there's, I mean, there's certain um, fundamentalist churches, and I mean, there's a there's a large segment of. Um, like, you know, you're sort of fans of American Family Association and stuff like that, and the people that, that follow that stuff really closely, um, that have sort of written off a lot of Hollywood. And, um, you know, I, I've encountered, uh, not in like Lutheran or Missouri Synod circles, um, but certainly in, in some of the, um, fundamentalist churches where, you know, they don't have a TV in their home and, and, you know, or, or they do, but they only watch, Christian videos and, you know, stuff like that. And, um, football games, Christian football games, <laughs> Tim Tebow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's a very small minority of, yeah. of the population. I think they're just doing it because, Hey, they, they don't have to worry about franchise fees. They don't have to worry about, you know, uh, it's, you know, that Marvel comics slash now part of, uh, uh Disney wants 5% of the gross to, to license. Spider-Man, that's an expensive that's a huge right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, so it's just a lot cheaper because you don't have to worry about that stuff. Uh, and I mean, the, and the, the last one to really do, well, oh, The Passion of the Christ did very well. I don't know how the Nativity movie did, the story of the Nativity. I don't know how that, uh, you know, how that did in, in the... Uh, uh, Not as well. And and I thought it was better. It was definitely, I mean, obviously more family friendly. Um, you know, it wasn't rated R. Uh, we took our family to it, and we really enjoyed it. 
I really liked it. In fact, I'm really kicking myself now when, when the passion of the Christ came out on DVD, I bought it and like, I think it's still in the shrink wrap and, but I didn't buy the nativity movie and I want to, uh, I mean, I'm glad I didn't buy it at the time. Um, because I would have bought it on DVD and now I can get it on Blu-ray, but, um, yeah, it, it was, I mean, it was really good and it was, it was very faithful to the story. I mean, there were, there were definitely, um, pieces that, uh, where they took Liberty or, you know, where you have the wise men showing up the night Jesus was born and, and things like that. Um, and, and they definitely added some stuff in, but I mean, some of the stuff they added in was really cool. Like, um, Joseph saving Mary's life and, um, and some stuff like that. And I mean, it was, there was some, some nice things that actually conveyed, um, some, at least loosely conveyed, uh, some biblical concepts, um, that sort of brought to mind other, uh, Christian concepts and, and things like that. So it was, it was really cool. I was really Good. happy with it, but yeah, it didn't do nearly as well. Um, I just want to know anyways. in the Noah movie, well, they go and God tells it to be the animals. Well, they go, you mean lions and tigers and bears? <laughs> oh my. Oh no! Lions and tigers and bears. Oh no! Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, oh my. my! You know. Yeah. So, yeah. I just, I, I just think that would be a wonderful. I don't know. Just sounds like a great line for a movie. It just, just came well, the, you know, all of a sudden. It you know it, it but, also raises an interesting question about just what interpretation they're going to go with, right? Um, and and I, I kind of have a hunch, but. Like you've got, they're, they're going to, no matter what they do, they're going to get blasted by people. Okay. Because, um, young earth creationists are going to insist that there should be Bibles or uh, Bibles. Sorry. I'm not sure where that came from. Dinosaurs on the, on the ark. Okay. I don't think they're going to do that. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, say a lot of people, um, that have, have really looked at the text, um, uh, and specifically, uh, people that believe that the flood was a, um, a regional flood and not a global flood worldwide in the sense of, um, the known world or, 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 um, the land, uh, cause the word Eretz can be translated where it says it covered the whole land. Um, it, it doesn't have to be translated globe. And in fact, that word in 70% of scripture is translated land, not earth. And referring to the planet, it's, it's usually used to refer to a, um, a, a, a region. And, uh, so then what kind of animals did he have? Well, probably not penguins, you know, um, animals that wouldn't be able to survive the trip from wherever their, uh, location, their habitat is to the ark. Right. Um, the sort of penguins are good. They gotta have penguins. <laughs> penguins are awesome animals. But yeah, you know what? I don't think anybody's really going to notice. Any well, of that. See, I mean, I... seriously. It's a movie. That's ultimately it's a movie, and you can't bring every type of animal that ever existed. And uh, you know, back in the nineteen, the nineteen fifties thing called the Bible or sixties, I remember. And yeah, you know, they, they, it was, it was, uh, creation and Cain and Abel and Noah and really kind of the first in, in the Tower of Babel. I don't remember you know anybody getting really, you know, hyper about it. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, you, you, you take this story and you turn it into a, you know, a, a, a movie and, you know, you did this, you know, it's going to, you, you leave out part of the story, you added new parts of the story. I mean, just ask Peter Jackson and, uh, uh, all the people who worked on uh, the Harry Potter movies. I mean, that's what you do. You're adapting a book to a, you know, a story to a movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, well, so you, you know, I, I expect that we will see gonna, giraffes. Younger and creationists lions. are, are going to get upset because it's, no dinosaurs. Well, the Bible doesn't say there are. You're just assuming there are to fit whatever it is turned you on, but uh, you know that doesn't say there are. So, so. Um, 
you know, they can just say it just, just says two of every, every kind of animal. So we took two of all the animals we have. Sorry, we don't have dinosaurs that we can we can go on around. That's too much CGI. But what <laughs> version of the Bible are they going to use? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This King is, James isn't uh, copyrighted. Sent to us by uh, our buddy Dave down in Virginia. Um, <laughs> and Dale, I know about, about this one. Um, so uh, the number one English selling Bible is the New International Version. It was published in 1978, fully revised in 1984. And then... They came up with a version over in Britain called Today's NIV, which was um, gender inclusive. They did not, not they did not change the language for God, but really change the language for, for people. How they talk instead of saying um, man, they used the term humanity or human or, or, or humankind. Mankind, yeah. Um, instead of saying he. Like uh, a man, he thinks they use uh, more like um, uh, uh, someone, uh, 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 whoever thinks, or they think instead of he thinks, or instead of his mind, it's their mind. He uses this plural, which I find myself doing all the time when I'm trying to say it can be men or male or female. Um, anyway, so this came out uh, so so. In the opinion of the publishers, they 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 rethought it and said they you know that went too far the, the TNIV. So they worked very hard. In the year 2011, they came out with an update to the uh, NIV. Um, now, interestingly enough, the uh, um, Wisconsin Senate uh, has looked at it, and they really don't have much of a problem with it. They, their uh, Bible translation committee felt that they could um, recommend it to the Wells. Hmm. Now, the Wells did not, uh, chose not to vote on it. They wanted to spend more time studying it. They didn't think it was enough. But the um, uh, Commission on Theology and Church Relations of the Senate and the staff, not actually the whole committee, just the staff, has wrote an opinion uh, based on it. And they used as their, 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 their basic thing, uh, a report that they put out um, a few years ago called Biblical Revelation in Inclusive Language. And uh, um, there's a couple of things here that kind of um, worries me, actually, about their, their review. Um one is that they state that, um, you know, uh, um, I don't have a problem uh, with regard to biblical language about God. If one wishes to translate accurately the words of Scripture, the language of both the Old and New Testament is clear enough to concerning the term, terminology about God. God and his spirit are cons consistently referred to in masculine terminology. That is God's revelation of himself. I don't have a problem. I actually I get really weird with the people who talk around and say, and God said to God's self. Hmm. I mean, you know, that makes as much sense as Jim said to Jim's self. You know, or Dale said to Dale's self. So uh, I don't have a problem with that. It also says that when scriptures speak about people, the text should be translated in a way that is consistent with the language which the biblical authors, in fact, use. Well, if you're going to take that as your basis for judgment, then you're going to find this thing faulty. But that's an, but you're evaluating it based on an opinion. Right. And, you know, and that's that whole on that whole debate about whether you translate it sons of Israel or children of Israel. All right. And there's legitimate reasons to translate it sons, even though it refers to both men and women. All right. Because of, if you understand um, inheritance rights, that, um, having, you know, the Bible says we receive, we receive adoption as sons. All right. And, and that's actually is saying that whether you're a man or a woman, um, we, we all receive the inheritance. It's actually a pro woman expression in the sense that women aren't second class citizens in the kingdom of God. All right. You get the same adoption as, 
um, you get the same inheritance and, and all of that, whether you're a man or a woman. Okay. But the problem is most people don't understand that because in our culture, there's, you don't, whether you adopt sons or daughters, it, that makes no difference. And like, what are you talking about? In our society, daughters are always equal to inheritors. Right. You know, in that society, women could, women don't inherit property. General, if there was a son around. Now, under Mosaic law, thanks to the daughters of Zalalafed, was that was their name, they got to inherit property because they said, you know, well, our father's dead, but why, did, why should that mean we don't inherit anything? And God said, well, what, what the women are saying is quite true. And so, uh, if there was a, so if there's no sons, the daughters inherited. But if there's a son, the daughters didn't inherit. So saying that we're all sons of God was very important because if they didn't say that, if he, if Paul had written sons and daughters of God, then, um, the women would not have inherited. I mean, that would, that's, that would have been a clear implication of, of that passage. Right. But we don't have that understanding anymore. Right. I mean, that, you know, to talk to people, you know, you have to, you have to go through a lot of, in my mind, if I have to go through a lot of hoops to explain why this is the, the correct phrase, then, you know, it's not a good phrase. Right, right. It's the I sort mean, of thing that you talk about, like in a Bible class or something like that, where you can actually sit down and talk about the historical context and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But for just like using it as a reading, um, in, it's like to say in, the in children the of God makes perfect sense, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or the sons and daughters of God. Oh, here it is. And this is this. I, I'm not sure I agree with this. Um, moreover, not only this is in this biblical re revelation inclusive language. Not only are the concepts of Scripture, but the very words of Scripture have been given to the biblical authors to write. That almost sounds like dictation. Mm. I mean, so according to that, then. Isaiah was given to being the walking the source, but Jeremiah was not. Hmm. Um, you know, the, 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 the author of Psalm 119 was given this acrostic form, but the Psalm, the author of Psalm 120 was not. I mean, it sounds, once you say that, it sounds very close to, uh, uh, uh um, um, very close to dictation. I mean, First Corinthians, Paul says, "Oh yeah, um, yeah, I baptized this guy and I baptized this guy. I don't think I memorized baptized anymore. Oh yeah, I baptized a family of stuff on us. Uh, I don't remember if I baptized anymore. That was that that was direct. Those, those words, I can't remember who I baptized was given by the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, because uh, when we were doing that, it's interesting. We were we're doing First Corinthians in my Bible class, and I I told the people that you know stuff in us was there when Paul's writing the letter. He mentions being there." And you can just imagine Paul's writing this letter and going, I get baptized Crispus and I baptized Gaius. I can't remember if I baptized anyone else. And Stephanus going over there, hello. <laughs> <laughs> this, oh, yeah, I also baptized the family of Stephanus. Uh, you know, and everybody is laughing. You know, as, as I said, you know, but, you know, I, I see it more, much more as a mystery. I'm not sure I'm going to, I mean, the, the words are the very words of God. I'm not always sure. That I would want to say that, you know, those words, those, those, those words, the very words of scripture were given the authors to write. Yeah. I mean, it's a fine line, you know, because, and I, I, for me, the best example has always been, um, the writings of Luke, uh, because Luke being a doctor, it, it comes up very clear that Luke is in the medical profession when you read his writing. He's, he, I mean, he's, he's meticulous. He's precise. He's, he's, um, you know, he's written, it's written like a scientist and, um, but, and he also, he uses medical terminology. He's the one that refers to Jesus sweating like great drops of blood. Well, that's a medical condition, you know? So, um, you know, so that comes yep. through very clearly. What are, what is the actual words of Jesus? Um, so that, uh, uh, um, in Matthew, Jesus always talks about the kingdom of heaven. In Mark and Luke, he always talks about the kingdom of God. So which word did Jesus, well, Matthew's a Jew, so he's not going to say the kingdom of God. So which, which, which phrase did Jesus actually use? Which is the actual word of Jesus? Kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God? Or, what is it kingdom of heaven and Mark and Luke are translating it? You know, and so I, I just, 
you know, I, 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 I worry I, that that phrase, that sentence really concerns me. So they bring up two, two issues that they've got problems with uh, in this report. One is Genesis 1. And uh, the way the 20 and I, B says, let us make mankind uh, in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, the wild animals, and over the, all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Um, I'm going to actually agree that I really have a real problem with that translation. Um so uh, the, the word Adam means humanity, mankind, hum, humankind. It's really what the word means. It's a man as opposed to a dog, a cat, uh, lions, tigers, and bears. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, the ish is the husband, the male. But there is, you know... Uh, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. In my mind, I've always, you know, talked, you know, you talked about the plurality, the unity and plurality there. Yeah, almost a picture, a little bit of the Trinity. Yeah, that there's, there's two yet one. Mm-hmm. And so I think there, I think they have a legitimate issue there. Although I wouldn't worry so much about saying, Oh, let us make mankind in our image, but you know, mankind let, and that he may rule. But there, there's this, this this oneness. I mean, it's a very you know definite thing there. So there, I, I can agree. The second example they have is, is Psalm eight, and the NIV reads, "What is mankind that you are man mindful of them, human beings? Plur substitution for son of man that you care for them." You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. And uh, then they, 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 they don't like that. They don't like some of those changes. And again, I, I, I understand a little bit where they're coming from. It's another one that I ha- happen to uh, struggle with a little bit. On the other hand, um, the rationale for the translation changes seem to be desired to emphasize the universal truth about all humanity. That humankind has received glory and honor as the crown of creation. Um, but if you read Psalm 8 in its original context, it's exactly what it's talking about. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Understanding Hebrew with parallelism, son of man in this case refers to mankind. Right. That's, that is it. Um, then it talks about, you know, Hebrews 2, 5 to 9. Uh, note that these verses testified to the Lord Jesus. That's not true. Because I did, I did uh, an exegesis on this. What Hebrews argues is, the author arguing Hebrews is, so we have this psalm, and it says, but if we look at things, we realize this psalm is not true. All creation is not subject to man. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. And by the way, the text from and quoted in Hebrews only works if you're quoting from the Septuagint. It doesn't work if you're quoting from the Hebrew. Hmm. You know, so that brings other oh, that course that brings up whole other issues. You know, oh, yeah, we some, talk about words, yeah. Yeah, we talk about the very words of God. I mean, um, uh, because another place in Hebrews, I, again, if you quote from out of the, out of the Hebrew, it makes no sense. It only works if you quote from the Septuagint. But you know the Septuagint is not you know accurate in its translation at that point. Um, so that brings whole issues of inspiration up, if you ask me. Um, you know, uh, um, um, and so I, I'm not. Uh, and then it gets on, you know, up to, uh, um, son of man, human beings for son of man impoverishes the understanding of son of man as the self designation of our Lord throughout the Gospels. Jesus uses a term, particularly in Son of Man from the Old Testament, that indicates full humanity and refers it to himself. This is of great importance, especially seen in light of Daniel 7. When Jesus refers to Son of Man, he's only refer- he's really just referring to Daniel 7. Mm-hmm. The Son of Man who is given over the kingdom of God. He's really not picking up other Son of Man references. Mm-hmm. And you can 
you can, you could certainly, uh, I think, argue that yeah. use the translation set up. Although, uh, uh, looking, oh, okay. I've been using NIV 2011 in my devotions, and we've been using it as a lectionary in our church. Okay. Mm. okay so now we you see your mode, your, uh, you know, the agenda behind it. Using this, uh, because I, you know, I don't like, I don't definitely don't like the ESV, and I have struggled with, um, you know, some of the texts that, you know, especially again, you're dealing in, in a in a Bostonian mindset, where you know, to use inclusive language, especially in a lot of the academic mind, you know, areas up here, it, it's just a given, and uh, you know, come back to this male-oriented language, is very different. Well, anyway, but throughout the Old Testament, I I can't find a place. Other than Psalm eight, where Son of Man is used uh, uh, just as a human being, um, I mean uh, Ezekiel is consistently Son of Man. Dan, one like a Son of Man, not like a human being. Hmm. So, you know, other than you know Psalm eight, I really can't see too many of those places where it it comes from, where where it's used. Uh, on the plus side, and it's interesting because he, he talks about, well, you know, we're really not talking about the, the whole translation. We're really not doing a judgment on the entire in a, as a translation. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the improvements in it is that um, uh, Acts 3.20 was changed from uh, he must remain in heaven, which is a Calvinist translation, to heaven must receive him, which is much more accurate. So the one of the big objections that we've had to it for some time was corrected. Uh, so, um, uh, but again, those people out there who don't like the NIV 2011, and there are several of them, um, they are the ones who are behind the ESV, um, mostly. Um, you know, they're uh, you know this is this is great for them because they have this cr- critique. But I noticed in the Christian Post article, it didn't say, oh, yeah, the Wisconsin Synod of the Lutherans, so it doesn't have a problem, didn't have much of a problem with it. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Now, I've never been a big fan of the NIV. I mean, I've used it when Synod was using it in all of their publications and stuff. I used it, too, just for the sake of consistency. Um, I, I do use the ESV in our traditional service. Um, I, honestly, uh, the biggest reason being because I use Lutheran Service Builder to put the services together. And uh, it's just, there's no way to use a different translation uh, for readings. It would be a lot of extra work, and it's just, it's good enough uh, to I, use. I you, you know, use propitiation all the time. <laughs> well, oh, that's, don't even get me started on the word propitiation, <laughs> especially especially with, uh, with um, uh, Reformation Day coming up. <laughs> you uh, uh, used the wow consecutive in your preaching. <laughs> so, but we use uh, actually the funny thing is um, when I put my sermon together and and uh, when I actually like quote my text in my sermon, um, I use the same translation that we use for our Horizon service, and that's the New Living Translation. But that's also inclusive language. To a greater degree, yeah. I mean, I, I've been comfortable with the level of inclusive language that it uses. It's the same, same, same level. But I get, but uh, you know, I mean, it's even a little bit freer translation. Um, I'm sure that would uh, be, you know, be on the CTCR's uh, good list either. I'm sure not. But um, yeah, just don't confuse it with. Uh, yes, it it has its roots in the old Living Bible, um, you know, paraphrase. But then they decided, well, let's kind of take some of the ideas that we used for this and um and make a a readable uh translation and and i find it it it's it's also um what i use for my personal devotions um because i find it easy to read and i don't have to it's it's not a head scratcher to just get through the language and i can just um you know and and there's times where i go uh let's check you know either go back to the original language or or check like the um New American Standard or um, or the World English Bible; those are the two uh, sort of really literal uh, word for word kind of stuff. Um, the the ones that if I'm translating from the original languages, 
um, I, I check my translation against them and usually pretty close. And if we're different, that's, I can, a lot of times theirs is better than mine. <laughs> so I like, um, so we use that stuff. However, even in this inclusive language, we don't have Mrs. Jesus. Uh, oh, man. Good Lord. This one is just kind of goofy, it, but it was huge in the news. Uh, it was probably, huge. probably mostly because of the Da Vinci Code, even though that was a long time ago. That was a, no, I don't think it had, I think it was, I think it was a big deal because, okay. It was a big deal. This was done so very carefully to maximize media attention. I yeah. mean, uh, so, uh, 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 what's her name? Karen King at Harvard Divinity School. Now, uh, the, the, the Boston Globe says she's a historian of early Christianity. She is that. Actually, she is a Gnostic specialist. Yeah, she's yeah. a specialist in Gnosticism. And she is a very good um, um, uh, historian. She really is. She's very, very good. But so she had this little fragment. It's no bigger than about a business card. Um, and it has some stuff on this, you know, written in uh, Coptic southern dialect of Egypt. And it has eight broken lines, you know. And fourth of them, Jesus said to Jesus said to them, my wife, the next line reads, she will be my disciple. Now, this is out of a scroll. This is a, a little, you know, not even as big as a three by five card out of a whole scroll. Right. It's, it's like, you know, someone cut a piece. So you're not like, you don't know the rest of the what's around it. Right. Now, on the one hand, now, I, don't, I mean, she, she, she surely works this out because she's going to give this paper on this thing. Um, you know, across the street from the Vatican. But before she does that, um, the, the Globe and the New York Times, Boston Globe and New York Times, which are owned by the same company, and Harvard Magazine are brought into this joint interview. And the night before she delivered the paper, she's going to deliver this paper, you know, they, they all print this, this, this stuff. And I mean, and she gets, and it's very interesting because according to the article, I mean, she says, this is not saying we've got a smoking gun that Jesus is married. Uh, matter of fact, I mean, it, it, her paper, she says, she even says that uh, very, very carefully. Uh, she says that, uh, um, you know, it is, uh, this fragment does not provide evidence that historical Jesus was married. Given the late date of the fragment, it's, you know, third, third or fourth century, um, you know, and, and the probable date of original composition, the second half of the second century. So she says that. At the same time, however, in the Boston Globe article, the Boston Globe says, but the fragment, which King provocatively calls the gospel of Jesus' wife, you know, does show that some early Christians believe Jesus was married. Well, the, the reality is, no, they did not. Gnostics believe that. Mm -hmm. And Gnostics are not Christians. Now, there's some did a lot of debate in the early church whether Christians should be married. And it could very well be that this is, you know, kind of a made-up story that came late second century. But it'll be among the Gnostics, not among the Christians. Right. Um, so that's, you know, that, and it got to be a huge thing last week. And, you know, the gospel of Jesus' wife. Well, now, of course, there's a lot of issues about the authenticity of this. Um. Because um, um, there is a um, – she had the papyrus um, analyzed, and it was found to be authentic. But uh, now – this is from the First Things blog. Um, it says um, one scholar after another and one coptologist after another has weighed in, pointing out serious problems with the pale paleography, the syntax – um, and the troubling fact that almost all the text has been extracted from the Gospel of Tim uh, Thomas, principally from Log Log Logia 30, 101, and 114. Uh, and then there's also questions about the, the ink and whether or not that's authentic. Or this, you know, and so, so now the, 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 
question is coming to be, um, is Harvard Theological Review even going to publish her paper? Hmm. Because they said last week, no, they're not. Then they said, yes, they are. Then they're like, well, we're not sure. So, so I mean, okay, regardless of whether it's it is actually dates back to when it claims to have. Okay. Um, what it comes down to is like, how do we as Christians respond to this? Okay. There's lots of Gnostic writings out there. All right. But we put about as much stock in them as we do the writings of Joseph Smith and the book of Mormon. All right. Think of it oh. as fan fiction. Okay. <laughs> That's the best equivalent I've been able to come up with. You know, somebody takes the, you know, the actual, the, the real thing and decides to write their own version of it and, or, or like, you know, so the, the continuing story or, or whatever, uh, the way a lot of, uh, Star Wars fans think of the prequels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those are, those are kind of. It's, 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 yeah, I, I mean, even, even calling it fan fiction is going a little far. I mean, be, but they, they're trying to protect Jesus' divinity and his humanity, and they, they, you know, um, but it's all, it's definitely fiction. I mean, you know, I, you got to put it with the other Gnostic writings, the ones that said, you know, Jesus was, you know, the little brat who, you know, was making clay pigeons on the Sabbath and clap, and guys said, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath and go, yeah, we'll just watch and claps and they fly away. You know, I mean, you know, you know, brat Jesus. I mean, it's the same thing. Right. And this is made worse because you had, it, it was, you know, released to the media in a very sensational way, you know, time to be sensational. Uh, and then you had the professional bloggers out there and the amateur bloggers out there. And, you know, so just, it just, you know, and stuff like this takes years to research. I mean, you know, um, you know, the, you know, the, you know, a lot of people are like, I'm, I'm not a paper, you know, papyrologist. You know, that's studying papyri is not my thing. But the ones who have studied it, they seem to think it, uh, it's an authentic piece of papyri from the right era. Okay, that's good. Um, but, you know, who, you know, but you got to have the scholars, the, the people who, who study the ink. You got to have the people who study Coptic literature, um, you know, and have them do it. And it takes time and peer review. Yep. Uh, yep. And, and, you know, and, and, and it, I mean, it's it's worth knowing whether this is a legit this is a legitimate piece of history or not. Okay, right. but I just I mean, it's got to be emphasized that for if you're not a history buff, interested in that particular time period and that particular not just time period but that particular group of um of of uh heretics that like to uh take um christianity and sort of warp it into their own thing okay that the christian church never accepted um and it wasn't that it wasn't that there was some conspiracy that the um that the the leadership said no we don't like you guys and it was a close vote or you know all this kind of goofy stuff like if you read dan brown okay um nope Nobody ever took these guys seriously, and they didn't even want the Christian, the Orthodox Christian Church to take them seriously, because they thought they were better than everybody else. They were, I mean, they were essentially a secret society. And, um, you know, so, you know, when you see, you go to the bookstore and you see the lost books of the Bible and, and you know, stuff like that, they weren't lost. They were thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> they came across him and went, this is drivel. This is ridiculous. This is stupid. And they threw it away. The same way that if you came across something that a, a um, you know, 13-year-old girl wrote her uh, sequel to one of the Harry Potter books, <laughs> you'd look it over and go, well, very nice, pat her on the head, <laughs> and walk away. 
Đấy. Uh, I, I like what the uh, the Harvard the uh, Divinity School website says about this. Um, it asks if um, as a Q and A on this thing, and it says, uh, "Does it prove that Jesus was married?" No. Uh, there is no claim that uh, historical evidence that he was, nor is there any reliable historical evidence to support the claim that he was not married, even though Christian tradition has long held that position. The oldest, most reliable evidence entirely si- silent about Jesus' marital status. And one guy says this, he says, uh, nor is there any reasonable, any reliable historical evidence to support the claim that Jesus was not an alien from another planet. Tradition has long held that position. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest and most reliable evidence is entirely silent about whether or not Jesus was a member of the species Homo sapien. <laughs> it, it doesn't say he wasn't a smurf, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's it's it, it, it you know it's, uh, it's something goofy there. It's just really funny. So, but there needs to be you know more careful. Um, uh, update. Uh, you know, if it's, you, you you gotta really go through this stuff. And in our internet, you know, media saturated age, it's it's hard to discuss these ty- types of things. Uh, I mean, I I could just some of the the uh, uh, a couple of the uh, columnists up here. It was just like you people are just insane. You need to discuss this. Well, Dale, the last story is yours. It's about your favorite person in the world, any gainer. So I will let you deal with this one. <laughs> Gaylor. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and, and this is interesting because the article was, um, is, uh, from examiner.com, which is a, uh, basically a blogger website, but they, uh, some of their people get a hold of some good news stories and stuff like that. Okay. So, um, we're dealing with some billboards. Uh, from the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and um, they they look like uh, church, like stained glass, and but it says "Imagine no religion," quoting John Lennon. Um, I wonder and, if uh, going after him that for um, um, copyright, but that's you probably need a bigger piece. You know, clearly it's a reference to that. Since they have the word "imagine" on the top and then no religion underneath it, you know it's it's clearly a reference to that. But I, I imagine they would say it's more of an homage, you know, and uh, get away with it that way. But um, th- so they put up these billboards, and and the big thing about these billboards is that they put them up in Tennessee, right? Um, and uh, at uh, the Knox County Commission and the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, right? Um, and it, it says, those readers who might be from East Tennessee already know that there's no locally elected civic body in North America that's been able to demonstrate that it needs more prayer in order to function than does the commission of Knox County. <laughs> <laughs> so the big complaint, and, and they're talking about the, FFRF, besides putting up these uh, banners, um, is also that they are targeting the pregame prayers at the University of Tennessee home football games, All right? And and the um, the author of this article, their point is that look, this is a part of our culture, right? It's not just about religion because even if there are are people that do not share the same faith, uh, they tend to respect those who do, All right? It's part of the culture. And so stop coming in from, like, where you'll get one, they'll only come in and do this stuff um, if they have local support. Well, the problem is you get, like, one or two people that are sort of extremist secularists um, that try to bring them in. And, And what does it do? Well, it gets a whole bunch of people mad at them. Um... It causes a bunch of churches to get riled up, and uh, so I suppose they can kind of sit back and pick on them. Um, but it doesn't really benefit their cause. It doesn't um, 
help to uh, to generate sympathy in their community or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, they're basically saying, look, you come in here, you um, you you make fun of us, uh, you don't know us, you don't know anything about our culture, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, but you come in here acting all superior, and you're just in irritation. You know, I mean, you know, if if you live in a place like Madison, right, which is where they're based out of, um, having grown up there, I can tell you, the church isn't a big part of the culture there, right? Um, it, Madison's all about politics. And so, yeah, they can, you know, they can think that, um, that, well, if it's not a part of the culture here, it shouldn't be a part of the culture anywhere, you know? Um, but you know what? In other places, it very much is. <laughs> the other town that I grew up in Wisconsin, the church was very much a part of the culture. They had a Christmas parade there, not a holiday parade. And, you know, and, and it was more like a pro-life rally than a Christmas parade. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, you had all these, uh, you know, pickup trucks, the signs on them that said, Jesus is the reason for the season and keep Christ in Christmas and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, and that's part of the culture there. Uh, it, so, it, um, um, well, why don't they go to your last, to, to, to Delaware, Iowa and tell them, Hey, um, you can't be doing this, uh, nothing going on on Wednesday nights because it's town church night. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, and probably because they haven't had the opportunity to. But the other thing is they tend to go places where they can get a lot of publicity. You know, it, it's sort of like the, um, the, um, the Westboro folks, you know, they're going to go places where they can get a lot of press. And you know what? If they go and protest in Delaware County, Iowa, um, first, you're going to have to spend half the article explaining where it is. <laughs> and, and by the time, you know, by that point, everybody stopped reading anyway. <laughs> they go, who cares? <laughs> so, yeah, oh, you go to a university, you know, lots of people there. Yeah, lots of people there that just kind of look at you and go, what is your problem? Tell you what, why don't you come over here, sit down. You know, have a deep fried something <laughs> and uh, enjoy the game. And, yep. and if you don't want to pray, that's fine. You don't have to. But a lot of us would like to. So just shut up while we do. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, we won't make you do that. If you want to sit and play games on your phone or uh, crank out blog posts or something while we're doing that, you go right ahead. All right. People might look at you funny, but they'll do that anyway because they know you're not from around here. <laughs> yep, that's yeah, for sure. You know, it it comes down to um, being respectful of people, and um, you know, and the Freedom from Religion Foundation is not respectful of people. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. We're right, and. Um, and uh and if you disagree with us you're wrong and um and so we are going to mock you and ridicule you um because you are wrong so uh, all right so pray for them right you know the bible says to you know respond with kindness and heap burning coals on their heads um, that's what we as Christians are called to do. Uh, don't repay evil for evil. And, um, but, you know, I mean, at the same time when you're, uh, there's, there's that side. Um, but there's also the, you know, we live in two kingdoms. Um, there's also the sort of governmental side. And, and so you also at the same time have to talk about rights. And so, so, I mean, you know, and, and here's the, here's the great dichotomy of, of living in both the kingdom of grace, the Christian church, um, and the kingdom of power, the, 
secular government. Um, I should secular is the right word, but um, the you know the fact is that on the, we can fight against people for religious freedom or you know whatever terminology you want to use there, um, and at the same time we can pray for them. You know, it, it's sort of like um, somebody uh, does something horrible to a member of your family. You fight really hard to get that person um, put in prison, and then you go to prison and visit them. And and you tell them that I forgive you, and uh, you still need to serve your sentence. I, I firmly believe that. But let me tell you about Jesus, because I don't want you to go to hell. Maybe some people can do that. <laughs> well... Yeah, I mean, cannot. That's when Jesus said, "Love your neighbor as yourself." <laughs> he also knew that we couldn't do it, um, but it's something to strive for. And and some people can, and some people have, and you know, positive things have happened. But it's that's I know it's it's pretty tall order. Jesus calls us to tall orders, though. So that's true. Some taller than others. <laughs> so it's been good being with you all tonight. I uh, pray that you enjoyed our, our podcast, and uh, we should be back. Hopefully, well, hopefully Dale will start getting these things put together, and we'll be back. Uh, should be back next week. And uh, again, if you got any more stories to share with us? Like uh, we did, heard from uh, Dave. Sure, appreciated his story. It was a good one to do. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if you got any stories, any comments, questions, thoughts, uh, always uh, podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Yep. Yep, or just leave a comment in the um, if you're watching this on YouTube or, or something like that, you can leave a comment there or go to our Facebook page. And if you haven't already, uh, go over to our Facebook page. Just search for CrossFeed News and you'll find it. And uh, and like us. So. They like me. They really, really <laughs> like me. <laughs> Good night, everybody. God bless. Good night.